Peak. Great to see you back in here. For those of you joining us uh, online or out in the patio, just so good to, to be with you. I'm looking forward to this time of teaching. If we haven't had the chance of meeting yet, my name's Michael, and I'm one of the pastors here as well. And so uh, inside your program, I think uh, Dre may have mentioned, you've got, you've got that. If you're watching online, you can download it there from the top of your screen. Uh, but we definitely need your note sheet as we go into our time of teaching. You all ready to go? Okay, let's pray together. So Father, we're just so thankful to be here and to be continuing this journey that we're on through this amazing gospel of this, uh, this man who was one of your closest personal friends. And uh, we thank you for the insights, Lord, that, that we are receiving from it, both from him and from you. And we pray that as we continue this journey today, that you would be with us in power, the Spirit would be here with us, and that you would be speaking uh, loud and clearly to each of us. Uh, and then, as always, that we would respond to the light that we receive by listening and following. We pray this in your name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, our story starts today in, a, in the desert, and uh, it's been a hot spell. And uh, uh, tempers are starting to flare. And uh, it, there, it's a large camp. Um, and as he looks back on this particular day, uh, honestly, he can't remember exactly how it started. Um, he can't remember who it was who spotted the danger first. But what he remembers is that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, people began to scream, to run, to shout, to hide. And one of the things that was most distressing to him right away that he didn't know what was happening, he couldn't see what was happening, where the danger was coming from, until he did. And when he saw it, his eyes got big and he, like everyone else, began to freak out, run for his life. And as time went on, the danger grew because those that were attacked were not recovering. There was no remedy. There was no solution. There was no answer to their pain. And as time went on, the hope began to die as the death toll began to rise. And they began to wonder, where was this going to end? Well, today we're continuing the series that we've been in now for a couple months. Uh, for those of you who are brand new, whether you're online or uh, here at, in, in our uh, auditorium, uh, the, the series is called Signs, A Path to Life. And what we're doing is a, it's an in-depth study of the life and teaching of Jesus as seen through the eyes of one of his closest friends, closest followers, uh, a man we call the Apostle John. And uh, John's writing at the end of his life, and he's inviting us to join him on a journey to explore uh, kind of his experience with Jesus, what he taught, uh, what he did, and especially focusing in on uh, seven of these supernatural signs, kind of supernatural works that Jesus performed that help us to understand who Jesus is and why he came, and for each of us, kind of lead the path to life. Now, if you were here last week, we looked at the first half of a conversation between Jesus and a top religious leader in Israel. Uh, it took place in Jerusalem. It's at the very start of his ministry. He's not really gotten super big public yet, but he's gotten down to Jerusalem uh, to, uh, to, he's taken his uh, first disciples down south to Jerusalem for Passover. And while he was there, he performed many of these supernatural signs I was just talking about. And as a result, this, uh, this top religious leader, his name is Nicodemus, comes to him and he wants to know uh, more about this kingdom of God that Jesus keeps talking about. What does it take to enter this kingdom? Uh, what does it take to be a part of that? And so Jesus surprises him and he says that, that in order to enter this kingdom, that Nicodemus, it's not enough that you're a Jew, part of the chosen people. It's not enough that you are a, a teacher, a leader of the nation. Uh, it's not enough that you know the Bible like the, by the, like the back of your hand, that if you want to enter the kingdom, something has to happen to you, something supernatural, something that's so profound and so powerful that Jesus says it's like starting life all over again. It's like being born again. And Nicodemus is really struggling to understand this. And so he, we, we left him last week. He said, well, how can these things be? How does this work? 
And so that's where we're picking up the conversation today. So if you have your Bibles, you have your apps, we're going to open up to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 3, verse 9. There in your note sheet, you have a section called Signs, Love, Life, and Light. And so in verse 9, Nicodemus says, how can these things be? How is this possible for people to be born again, to have their sins forgiven, to have this new life you keep talking about? And so Jesus said, and we looked at this last week, you are Israel's teacher, you're one of the top leaders of the nation, and you don't understand these things? I mean, these things should be making sense to you. And then Jesus says, uh, verse 11, very truly, and this is, remember last week, we, last week we learned this, whenever it says very truly, whenever Jesus says very truly in the NIV version, it's in the Greek, it's those two words. Do you remember what they are? Amen, amen. Yeah, amen, amen, or in Greek, amen, uh, amen, amen. And when he says amen, amen, this is like Jesus putting neon lights around what he's about to say, sit up. Pay attention, what I'm about to tell you is very important. And so this is the third time in this conversation with Nicodemus, he says, amen, amen. And he says, very truly I tell you, we speak, and, and when he says we, it's hard to know whether he's using like an editorial we, or whether, just speaking of himself, or whether he's talking about maybe himself and John the Baptist, or, or he's talking about himself and the Father. But uh, whatever he means, he says, that we, um, he says, uh, we speak of what we know. Uh, he says, what, what I tell you, I'm not making this up. Uh, this is Peter. We testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. So you've come to me, you've told me that you believe I'm a teacher sent of God, but when I'm telling you you have to be born again, you're not really buying it still. And so he says uh, in verse 12, I have spoken to you of earthly things. You know, that as a human being, you need to be born again, kind of here and now, and you don't believe it. How then will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things, uh, like where I come from? And verse 13, and he says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Now this word, this, word, this title, son of man, is Jesus' favorite term for himself, right? It's sort of a, a messianic term, but but uh, one that um, was not as well much, not as well used as much. And so Jesus would kind of form it for his own purposes. And so he says, um, he says, no one has uh, ever gone into heaven except the one who's come from heaven, the son of man. So you remember back in chapter one in the intro, we're gonna be talking about the intro a lot today. If we, when you remember when we, when we kicked off this series, I said in the intro uh, that John is kind of, kind of giving us a preview of where we're going in this whole, this whole uh, it's like a summary of what he's gonna be teaching. And remember in the intro, we said that you know, Jesus introduced, uh, I mean, uh, John introduced Jesus as the word the word who was with God, the word who was God, the word who became flesh, and now we're seeing where he got this from. Jesus is claiming pre-existence here. And so he says in verse uh, 12, I've spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How will you speak, uh, how will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. And then he says something incredibly cryptic. If you're there, if you're, Nicodemus, this is kind of on the par of you have to be born again. Because what he says next, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now, if you're Nicodemus, you've got to be saying, huh? This was, this was my explanation to help me understand. To understand this, we have to go back to the story we started the day with. We started the day with the story of a large encampment out in the desert. And all of a sudden, this unnamed person that I created is looking up and people are running, they're screaming. He has no idea what is going on. Well, this is a story that we're told in Numbers chapter 21. 
And so in Numbers chapter 21, we're told that the nation of Israel, you know, when they came out of Egypt, God rescued them from slavery. They come to Mount Sinai. They enter into this covenant, formal relationship with God, much like marriage, that we will be your people, you will be our God. They agree to listen and follow him. But as you know, because of their disobedience, for the next 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. And while they were out there, there were many times when they would rebel against God or even rebel against Moses, many times when they threatened to stage a coup and to replace Moses uh, with a new leader who would lead them back to Egypt, which would have been a disaster. And when this happened, God would have to often step in with some very creative and very severe discipline to get them to wake up and get them back on track. This is one of those times. And in this particular time, what God did is he unleashed, we don't understand how he did this, uh, just a whole brood of vipers, uh, poisonous vipers in the camp. So I want you to picture this. You're just sitting in the camp one day and all of a sudden you're looking, people are running, screaming. I mean, have you ever seen anyone just see one rattlesnake in the path? <laughs> right? Uh, Lynn and I were watching Indiana Jones, the first one the other night. When he's dropped down in that pyramid type thing, the snakes are all over. I mean, picture it like that. Most people freak out with a single rattlesnake. Imagine that there's all these venomous vipers going through the camp, biting people. They're, and so I was running, screaming, freaking out. And so now they're coming back to Moses and they're saying, hey, forget that thing about a coup. We need you to go to God and figure out what to do. And so he goes to, he goes to God and God tells him to do something that's very strange. It had to be seen very strange at the time. Something that would not make sense for 1,500 years when Messiah came. And what he told them to do is, Moses, this is what I want you to do. I want you to make a bronze snake like, like the vipers. And now imagine, you, you're gonna have to cast this thing, right? It's gonna take some time. In the meantime, people are dying. There is no remedy for the snake bite. People are dying Everyone's freaking out. He says, cast, make a, make a bronze snake. And he said, then I want you to put it on a high pole and put it up high so that people can see. And anyone, when they're bit, they can look to the snake and those who look will be healed. Very strange, right? But God is preparing this story early in the early chapters of the story for where the grand finale is gonna, the, the climax is gonna come later. But it's, so, so Jesus says to Nicodemus, in the same way that Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man is gonna be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will receive eternal life. Now, I'm sure for Nicodemus, this was as clear as mud. <laughs> but it doesn't bother Jesus. It doesn't bother him to say things people to understand and to wait for the right time for them to get it. We'll see it all through the, the Gospel of John. Now, it's very interesting because in the Gospel of John, it's often very difficult to tell when Jesus stops talking and John starts teaching. And the reason is, in ancient Greek, there are no quotation marks. So it's, un, it's like there's times where, and so what scholars have to do is look at it and say, okay, well, based on the vocabulary, based on the language, but based on the content of what's being said, do we think it's Jesus or John? And most modern scholars believe that Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus stopped here at verse 15 with this cryptic statement. And that, and, that, and that what we have in verse 16 to 21 is the apostle John giving his commentary on what Jesus just said. And now that John is an old man, now that the death and the resurrection of Jesus have happened, that John is gonna step in now and he's gonna give us as readers, here's what Jesus was talking about. So let's see what John says. So in verse 16, he says, this is what Jesus was getting at. For God, from a very famous verse, right? For God so loved the world. I mean, even if you've never been to church, you've seen it in an NFL game, right? John 3, 16. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And just quick sidebar, see that phrase, one and only son? In Greek, it's a single word. I won't go into it, but it's a single long word. 
It's a word that Jesus never uses of himself anywhere else, but John uses it of Jesus all the time. That's an example of why scholars would believe, hey, we think this is John's commentary, not Jesus' uh, words. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. Underline that word perish. Uh, in the Greek, it means be destroyed. Right? Should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, remember what we're learning in John. When we talk about eternal life, we're not talking about just length of life. Are you getting that? I keep saying it's not just length of life. It's a whole quality of life. It's the life of the future. In Greek, it actually says literally the life of the ages. So in Jewish thought, there was two ages. There's the current fallen dark evil age. We all live in now. There's the age when Messiah comes and the kingdom comes. That's the age to come. And so when, when Jesus talks about the, the life of the ages, he's talking about the life of that future kingdom breaking into space and time here and now. That this, this is the life of Jesus. It's the life of God. It brings, remember the DNA? We talked about the life. It brings the DNA of Jesus here and now. And so he says that this is why the son came, that whoever believes in him should not perish or be destroyed, but have eternal life. And catch this, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He did not come uh, to, to lower the hammer. He did not come to, to bring, yes, we're, are we an evil, uh, evil age? Yes, are we a rebel race? Yes, but he didn't come to destroy us. He came to save us. And says, so, um, he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, whoever believes in him, and remember in John's gospel, to believe in Jesus is more than just sort of a nod to God. Yeah, I guess I believe. It, it's really the sense of trusting him with our life. We, we believe he's the word that was with God and was God. We believe he's the word made flesh. We believe he's come to die for We've We've trusted him with our life. And so he says, so whoever believes in him is not condemned. Catch that. It's present tense. Notice he, he doesn't say that whoever believes in him won't be condemned. He says whoever believes in him here and now is no longer condemned. The moment we come to Jesus, we step over that line that we step from a condemned race to a pardoned race. We step from the old life to the new life. And it happens that moment uh, we give our life to Jesus. And so he says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe catches stands condemned already. Like you don't have to wait to the end of time to find out what's going to happen. We'll talk more about that later. You stand condemned already because they've not believed, not trusted, not listened, not followed in the name of God's one and only son. There's that Greek phrase again, one and only son. And he says, and this is the verdict. You know, if you go to court and you, you're condemned, they're gonna read a verdict over you. Uh, here's the verdict and here's the sentence. And he says, so, so here's the verdict that will be read over that person, that light has come into the world. Now remember, Jesus will, will call himself, I am the light of the world. He's right? talking about Jesus. So light has come in the world, but people love darkness because instead of light, because their deeds were evil. So, Light is an incredible gift, isn't it? Because it shows the path to where we're supposed to go, but it also exposes the truth about us. And so if the truth is that we're pursuing evil, then we, we don't want the light turned on. There's a reason why bars are dark, right? <laughs> that, that, that bad things happen in the dark, right? He says, light has come in the world. People love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. He says, so everyone who does evil hates the light. And they will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what they've done has been done in the sight of God. And so the, for the person who's a follower of Jesus, they're not afraid of that light. They're gonna come into the light because what it's gonna expose is what God is doing and has done in their life, has been done through God, These, this amazing work he's done in their life. All right, so, th so that's the passage. Uh, this, it's in this long conversation where 
Jesus is engaged by this spiritual leader of Israel. I want, uh, I want to be part of the kingdom. What does it take? Hey, it's not enough to be a Jew. It's not enough to know the word. It's not enough to be a leader. That something has to happen to you. It's supernatural. It's, it's like uh, being born again. Well, how would that happen? How is that possible? Well, the way it's going to be made possible is by the Son of Man being lifted up like the snake so that everyone who believes in him uh, can enter into this new life and receive this new life that I've come to give, all right? So that's the passage. Now, what I wanna do in our time together today is I wanna highlight uh, kind of three big picture uh, truths that Jesus and John are teaching in this passage about this whole kingdom, why Jesus has come, uh, how it works, kind of three kingdom realities, if you will. And so there in your note sheet, you have a section called Signs, the Rescue and Reality. So we're gonna look at three kingdom realities. And then we're gonna come back at the end, just one question. So the, the first kingdom reality is that what John the Apostle wants us to understand is that God's love is real. Um, that this, this story that he's telling us, you know, very early in this, in, this, in this gospel, he's introducing us to this man Nicodemus because he wants us to hear what Jesus said and he wants to understand what it means. And right at the beginning of the gospel, he wants us to understand that this is a love story. That this, this, this story that he's telling us about Jesus, it, it's the story of a God who's pursuing a fallen race. Right? That's what the story uh, is about. Now, it's interesting because I, uh, if once, once, like, if we have it right, and, and you know, and let me make it clear, like, we say, hey, where does John stop, where does Jesus start, stop talking, John start teaching? It's not for sure clear. I, like I say, most modern scholars think it, that's, uh, that ends at verse 15, that the split between 15 and 16, but if we go with that, I want you to catch how significant that is. Because Jesus gives this cryptic statement to Nicodemus that he probably didn't understand at the time. You know, how can a person be born again? Well, it's gonna happen because the Son of Man is gonna be lifted up uh, like the snake. Probably not clear at the time. Remember back in chapter two where the Jews said to Jesus, what gives you the authority to cleanse this temple? And he says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. You remember that? They had no clue what he's talking about. And you remember what John said, uh, that even his disciples had no clue what he's talking about, but after he was risen from the dead, then they understood. And this is very similar. Jesus gives this cryptic statement. John, uh, Nicodemus probably doesn't understand it, but John, looking back, he understands it. He says, let me explain the story of Jesus. Let me talk to you about why he's, go why he's gonna be uh, raised up on a pole. And he says, we need to start with love. Amen. So the very first thing he's gonna say is verse 16. So let's look at verse 16 again. Again, probably the most famous verse in the Bible for God so loved the world, or in the Greek, uh, and what the idea is, God loved the world, so this is what he did. Right? So, God, so God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that, the, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have this new life, this life of the future, this eternal life. Now, when you read this verse, if it's the only verse, it sounds like this was the father's idea, Right? And we know from Scripture that is true, but what we'll see in the Gospel of John, this is not just the Father's idea, this is the Son's, uh, the, the, the Father and the Son are teaming up for this. Uh, for example, uh, in, in, uh, in John's writings and the rest of John, but also in the letter of 1 John, we talked about le uh, last week. Look at the verse there on your note sheet, 1 John 3, 16. So we got John 3, 16, we have 1 John 3, 16. Here's 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. What does love look like? Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Right? So we have the Father and the Son uh, initiating together this rescue mission to come after a rebel race to restore the life that we lost due to our rebellion. Uh, later on, Jesus will make statements like this. There in your note sheet, down in John 10.10. 10. In John 10, he talks about how he's the good shepherd and he's come to give his life for the sheep. And look what he says. He says, no one takes it. 
talking about his life. He says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down. No, this is under my control. I lay it down uh, of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down in death. I have the authority to take it up. In other words, resurrection. But he said, this command I received from my father. So the father and the son are teaming up on a rescue mission for planet Earth. And they are teaming up to rescue a rebel race. In fact, when we get to John chapter 15, Jesus will say this, no greater love does a man have for his friends than to lay down his life. And then he'll say, you are my friends if you do what I ask you to do. And so this is, the, the, John wants us, at the very beginning, he wants us to understand this is a story of love. This is what this is about. It's a love story. Number two, the second thing he wants us to understand right at the beginning of this gospel is that the danger is real. This, this danger that we're in in a race is, is real. The father and the son are teaming up on this rescue mission by the power of the spirit, but it's not automatic. That we'll have a choice to make. We'll talk about that more later. And the danger is real. This is a serious situation. Now, it's an interesting thing that in our culture today, most people who believe in God, and most people do believe in God, but most people who believe in God believe that God is a God of love. And uh, they also believe that when we die, we go to a better place. Like I, I've never been to a memorial service. They said, poor Joe, Joe, he's burning in hell. You know, it's like, we all know Joe, we know the truth about Joe. You know, let's not kid ourselves. If there's a bad place, he's there, because we all know Joe. Like, no, when you go to a memorial service, it's always that they're in a better place. When someone dies, it's always in, well, I miss them, but they're in a better place. Now, here's what I want you to catch. Where did we as a culture get this idea that God is love and that we die, we go to a better place? Can I tell you where we got it? We got it from Jesus in the New Testament. Amen. You look throughout world history, uh, you look through the religions of the world, this is where it comes from. There is no other, there is no, right? It came from Jesus, it came in the New Testament. But what's so interesting is that as a culture, we've embraced, in a sense, the teaching of Jesus, that God is love, and the teaching that there is a better place afterwards, but we've rejected what Jesus has taught about the alternative. So we've embraced half of his teaching. And do you remember what I, I told at the start of this, that one of the dangers that we have to, to face as believers is we don't create Jesus in our own image. Remember we talked about that? Do you remember that back in chapter one, that we said that, uh, one of the, that John says, one of the reasons why Jesus came was to reveal God to us. Remember John 1.18, the intro, he says that no one has ever seen God, but God, the, only, the one and only, that word in Greek, the one and only, God, the one and only, who's in the closest relationship with the Father, he's revealed it. And in verse 14, I put it there in your note sheet, he talked about, and what did we learn about God when, when Jesus came to reveal him? He said, we, I could sum it up by two words, grace and truth. Grace, this love of God that we don't deserve, and truth, a truth that will set us free. Sometimes it's a, a tender truth, sometimes it's a tough truth. But grace and truth. And I told you that throughout this series, we're gonna see these two sides of Jesus. The tough Jesus, the tender Jesus. And we talked about the danger of this creating Jesus in our own image. Here is a great example. We're gonna see today the, the tender and the tough in the same passage. The passage that starts off that like, why is this rescue mission happening? It's because of this love of God that we don't deserve. But Jesus goes on to say, and there in your note sheet, you see it in John 3, there in verse 18, 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've come from. We give our life to Jesus. We follow him. We're no longer condemned. There is the tender Jesus, the love of God, right? He says, but whoever does not believe stands what? Condemned. Condemned already. And so this is the side of Jesus, what he's revealed to us about our case that we often don't want to face. That we, ought, we would often rather sweep under the carpet. We would ignore it. But Jesus is very clear. Look at the next verse, the John three sixteen verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to rescue mission that whoever believes in him should not what? Perish. perish. What happens if you don't believe? You perish. The danger is real. This is something as a culture we have turned our back on. The reality of the danger, the mortal danger we're in as a race. I often think of this, uh, I think of our race like, like being on the, like the human race is like the Titanic, being on the Titanic. You know, I was talking with someone the other day, and I was talking about, I don't really like, I don't like watching movies more than once. Uh, I know a lot of you do. My wife is like that. She'll watch, you know, I won't say what shows, but she, uh, <laughs> I, won't, I won't reveal her, her secret life. But, uh, uh, she'll watch the same shows over and over and over again. She loves watching shows again. I know some of you are like that. I won't ask for a show of hands, but, but and, and that's great. I wish I were like that, because if so, there'd be so many movies I'd, I'd just, to enjoy. You know, just keep enjoying them over and over again. But I like rarely watch a movie more than, like if I know what's going to happen, um, I just lose interest, right? So, like, remember when the movie The Titanic came out? Some of you are old enough. <laughs> Some are like, no, I never saw that, you know? Uh, I remember it was so popular, that movie. Was, and I was one of the last people in America to see the movie. <laughs> and the reason is, it's like, I know what's going to happen at the end. <laughs> like, I know the, sink, the boat is going to sink, you know? And so it's like, I'm sorry, spoiler. I should have said spoiler alert. <laughs> but you know, I, I think of that. It's like what Jesus is, what this passage is saying is as a, as a human race, we're a rebel race. We're in darkness. We're like the Titanic. And Jesus is, Mount the Father and the Son are mounting a rescue mission. They're sending a boat to get us off. The moment you're off, you're safe. But if you stay on, you're condemned already. It's just a matter of time because this ship is going down. And so, so John wants us to understand, hey, the love is real, but so is the danger. And that leads to the third reality that our choice is real. There's going to be a tremendous emphasis in the gospel of John as we go through about God's choice of us. That, that no one comes to the Father unless Jesus, or comes to Jesus unless the Father draws us. There's going to be a tremendous emphasis on, on the sovereignty of God and choosing us. But there is also this flip side that we'll see throughout the gospel of our choice and that we have to decide whether to get off the Titanic or not. And we're going to see this, uh, and, and John uh, starts telling us this about in the intro. Remember what I said about the intro? It's like John's uh, opening statement in a court case where he's telling you, here's what I'm going to prove, and he's going to come back to it. We're going to see it all the way through. We've already seen it today. And the word that came from heaven and came down and so on. But here's another example of it. You know, back in chapter one, John said that the, in the beginning was the word and the word was with 
God and the word was God and he was a creator of the universe. And then he said, the, the word became flesh. Do you remember that? And then he said, he came unto his own but his own did not receive him. Do you remember that? He's summarizing the story. In fact, there in your notes today, I put this verse there for us. He came to that which was his own, his own people, his own race, his own creation, but his own for the most part did not receive him. They, they, didn't, they didn't receive him as the word made flesh, their creator who's come to rescue them. This is yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become what? Children, see, we're back to the born again theme. Do you see where it's going? Children born not of a natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. See, this is how that, this chapter started. This, the chapter started, how can you be part of the kingdom? You have to be born again. And from the very beginning, John told us there's some who will receive that truth and there's some that will not receive that truth. And so why will some receive it and some not receive it? Because there's a price to receive it. And this is what he says there on your note sheet in John 3, 18. He talks about this price. He said, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Why? Because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And he says, this is the verdict. What is the judgment? What is the problem? Well, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. There, there's a choice that in, in order to accept this offer of new life, we have to face the reality of who we are. And we have to turn from darkness and turn to light. There's a choice involved. And so three great realities. The, the, the love is real. The danger is real. The choice is real. So it leads then to a very important question. And there in your note sheet, there's a section called signs, the choice. And the question is, how are you responding to the light? In your life right now, how are you responding to the light? And I, I wanna ask this question on a couple different levels. Uh, the first level is for those of us here, whether you're here with us in the worship center, you're on the patio, you're online, but for whatever reason, you are pursuing Jesus in your life. You're sort of like Nicodemus. You're coming after him. You've been coming to Rocky Peak, perhaps. You're reading about Jesus, and you're pursuing truth. And the light is beginning to dawn on you of who Jesus is. Your, your, your perspective is beginning to change. But with that light comes responsibility. And as you realize who Jesus is, there's no option of being in no man's land. Amen. That you have to receive or you have to reject. And if you don't receive by default, it is a rejection. And so Jesus is coming. The message is, is that God loves you no matter who you are, what you've done that Jesus always cares more where we're going than where we've, come, where we've come from. And that he doesn't care about your past. That he, he loves you. He's come to give you a new life, to transform your life. He wants to forgive you. He wants to give you this new life. He wants to teach you how life is designed to live. But you have to decide. Will you receive him or will you reject him? Right. So that's, that's a decision we all have to make at the start of our spiritual journey. But I wanna talk with those of us here who have made that decision. We've made the decision that yes, we are followers of Jesus. We've received him as the word made flesh, the one who was elevated, put up on the pole so that we could believe in him. Through his death, we receive life. And we've experienced that new birth like we talked about last week. But the question for us still is, how are we responding to the light? Because here's the thing, Jesus doesn't just turn on the light one time and then call it quits. Amen. 
that he is the light of the world. And as the light of the world, he is always turning up the brightness in our life. And every time he turns up the brightness, it's so that we can see the evil and dysfunction of our ways so that we can turn from that and get a little more life, experience more of the life that he came to give. Amen. There in your note sheet, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So, so as we follow him, the light gets progressively brighter. Amen. And so the question is, how are we responding? For those of you who have been at Rocky Peak a long time, you know that one of the most important spiritual principles that I believe in, I believe the Bible teaches this, is, is what I call the dimmer switch principle. And uh, it's a very simple principle. And it goes like this, is that when God turns up the light in our life, we have an option. We can either move towards that light or we can turn and run from that light. And when he if we move towards the light, we get more light. Because the closer we get, the brighter it gets. And so as we respond to the light that he gives us, we get more light and we see the next step and we just continue to grow and be transformed. But of course, the opposite is also true. That when Jesus turns on the light and we don't like what it reveals, or what it requires. There's a tremendous temptation to turn our backs to that light and move the other way and pretend that we didn't see it. And as we move away, it's getting what? Darker. Because we're moving away. It's one of the most important spiritual principles of life. When he when, when he shows us light, we move towards light. It's like a dimmer switch getting turned up. When we reject the truth, like a dimmer switch getting turned down. And so for us as followers of Jesus, this is not a one-time thing. This is a way of life. You know, in Proverbs, it says that the way of the righteous is like the shining of the light of a new day that goes brighter and brighter until, full, until, until noonday. And this is what happens, is that we follow Jesus, the light of the world, is he reveals truth. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's painful. Yes, sometimes it costs us surrender. Yes, sometimes we have to, to turn around and say no to that. And, and we no to some things. Yeah, yes, but as we do, there is release in us a new life, a new power. And we experience more and more of the life of the age to come, what he came to give us, this eternal life. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for this beautiful passage. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for John. We thank you for how they team up to be our teachers here today and to reveal your incredible love, this supernatural life you've come to give us, and the path to life, the giving our lives, believing in you, trusting in you, following you, one step at a time. And Father, we pray that this would be our story, that we would go from glory to glory, from brightness to even brighter, the dimmer switch would continue to get turned up as we turn our lives to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen.